something to say. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, especially if you're reading my new book, Crucify My Love, which is available on Kindle, paperback, and as a podcast. Just search for Mask of the Gods wherever you're listening to me, and it should be there. And if it's not, let me know, because I need to fix that. <laughs> so today's episode, we're going to talk about something that I, I really don't like talking about for several reasons, because one, I don't want to sound like I'm dunking on anybody who either likes modern horror or is a writer of modern horror. I, I just have my own problems with the genre and thought it would be fun to talk about what they are, because I'll be honest, from time to time, I've been called a horror writer. I've had my work featured in Horror Addicts, and yeah... But I don't consider myself a horror writer. So, what's going on there? Let's talk about that in just a minute. If you haven't already, and the option is available in the app that you're listening to me on, don't forget to rate this episode or the podcast, whichever you can. Helps me a lot. Helps the algorithm know that it should share me to more people. And if you're just checking out the podcast, why not subscribe? I do new episodes every day. It'd be really cool for you to hang out and, you know, be a part of it. So, I, I think before we get started here, we, we have to start parsing emotions, because this is, for me, where a lot of modern horror goes terribly wrong. Because, for me, when I am looking for something in a horror genre, I'm looking for something specific. And it's not normally what I get, at least not anymore. So what are the emotions that we are going to be parsing here? Well, I think we can give them different names. And many of us may use the same word for different experiences. So I'm going to try to actually explain what I mean by each one, but... Emotions are a funny thing, so you may not agree with my definitions. But, okay, so creepy. Creepy is a fun adjective that comes to mind a lot when I think of horror fiction. Something that is creepy makes you feel a little bit anxious, but also a little on the edge of your seat. There... That, that blurry line between anxiety and anticipation gets even blurrier. So, w normally when you're anxious, you're just dreading a thing. And dread is a very different emotion. We'll talk about that in a minute. And when you're anticipating a thing, you're often more excited. When something's creepy, it hits you in this way that you're kind of interested in it, but you're afraid of what it's going to turn out to be at the same time. There's kind of this mix of that anticipatory excitement and that anxious dread. Creepy is a very fun emotion and one that I rather enjoy. Whereas for me, creepy is a rather visceral experience. Dread, I find a little bit more distant. Dread is more what happens when that anxiety gets mixed with fear where you know it's going to happen you are just waiting for it to happen and it hasn't happened just yet and so you find yourself kind of hoping that it won't and dreading that it will whereas straight up fear fear is kind of the easiest one to explain it's when kind of the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you're just kind of paralyzed and locked for a minute. And then the decision happens in your brain between fight or flight. What are you going to do? And because it's a book or a movie or a TV show or even a song, that fight or flight can either be to give in and just be like, yeah, or to kind of scream and jump back. You know, those are kind of 
two typical experiences of fear. These are handy emotions. Terror being another one of them. Terror is an emotion that H.P. Lovecraft refers to as being different from, from fear. And why he differentiated his um, supernatural horror from other forms of horror. Because terror is an all-encompassing dread. It is a fear that just grabs you and won't let go. It lingers. It haunts your imagination. It fills your dreams. It gives you nightmares. Terror is that experience that just shakes you to your core. And then there's nauseated and repulsed. And I feel like these go together because if you're nauseated, something made you sick to your stomach. And if you're repulsed, you're just like, ew. And this is the problem that I have with a lot of modern horror. The earlier emotions that were on this list are trickier to maintain and manage, especially over a period of time. The later emotions are really easy. I can show you something disgusting. Ooh, ew, gross. I, I can make something jump out at you, and you jump and are repulsed by it. Those emotions are, for the most part, easier to attain and thus easier to go for. You see long descriptions of graphic violence and watch portrayals of suffering and pain with, of course, all of the oozing, gooing, bleeding, blah, 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 that you can throw into it because it's easy. It, it's really easy to do. The other ones, the dread, the fear, the terror that grips you and just won't let go, those are harder to achieve. As far as horror movies go, the two best that I've seen in a really long time, though one is almost never classified as horror, are Get Out, which was brilliant and has had quite enough said about it, so I'm not going to just pile on. Um, I believe I actually did an episode about it a while back. And The Arrival, which I also believe I did an episode on. But The Arrival is almost the perfect supernatural horror, especially as you start putting together the pieces of everything that's going on. It is a story of existential dread and fear that grips and haunts and stays with you long after you watch it. And I think the same is true for Get Out. Now, there are others that I could list, and I am not... I am not that person. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you a really long list. But this is where classic horror that worked starts crossing paths with horror that doesn't for me. The Exorcist, for example. The original Exorcist movies have some moments of dread and terror and really works on a lot of levels. And it mixes in the gross and the repulsive because... It's right on the cusp of the two things passing by each other. Another place where it's really easy to see the difference here is the first Paranormal Activity movie and every film that followed. The first Paranormal Activity movie was based almost exclusively off of dread, fear, and creepiness. It was an anticipation. You were watching because you knew something was going to happen, and you're scanning every little bit of the screen, looking and waiting for the thing to happen. Whereas, most of the others are just jump, jump scares and, you know, other things that just were irrelevant to actually making you feel fear. For me, both gothic fiction... Well, actually, I'm going to say break this up into three categories. Gothic fiction horror fiction, and supernatural horror fiction are all designed as a tool to manage these emotions in the viewer slash reader. So if you are creating a tale in any of these genres, your purpose and point is, while yes, to entertain, 
but also to manage and shepherd these emotions, giving the appropriate breaks when and where necessary. Because if you stay in one of these sensations for too long, you get numb to it. So you have to have moments of release. You have to have moments where the tension breaks and you get to experience something else, even if for a brief period of time. This is where modern horror, for me at least, completely falls apart. Because they've abrogated this very technical, very tricky game of managing expectations and shepherding your experience of these very sharp and intricate emotional states and rely purely on gross grossing you out or scaring you with a jump scare or just making you go ew why would anyone ever do that and once you get to that point to me you've left the realm of horror so i'm going to kind of talk about one of my favorite works of horror and it's one that as far as anybody knows is out of copyright so I'm not so concerned with somebody coming after me and saying, why did you talk about my piece of fiction? Because it's copyrighted and it's mine. And that's H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space. To me, it's a short piece of fiction, so it's very easy to look at, and it's very easy to see how he manages our expectations. And in my opinion, it's probably his best work. And I don't mean that I don't like his other stuff, what I mean by that is this story very efficiently does everything that it needs to do. Probably the only other story that I can think of that he wrote that comes close is the statement of Randolph Carter. So how does the story work? It's about an asteroid that hits our atmosphere, goes through, leaving a strange sheen in the sky as it falls, impacts the ground and starts leaking this strange multicolored gas from it. And the gas seems to do terrible things to anything that gets too close and anything that encounters it. Now that could easily be turned into any of the other kinds of horror that we would see today. And should this be turned into a modern movie, well, we're going to be dealing with, I don't know, rabid squirrels or, you know, probably beavers because they can make double entendre jokes about them raccoons possums wolves what have you but the actual horror in this story is we find out about this asteroid we find out about this meteor impact because there's a reservoir going to be put in in this area and the government has sent somebody to check and make sure everything's all right. And throughout the story, as we're seeing that they are learning, no, everything is not all right. This is bad. This is terrible. This is horrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. The dread kicks in because of the laissez-faire attitude of the inspector. And we realize when we get to the end and they build the reservoir that they just don't care. The safety of everyone who will be poisoned by this water it doesn't matter. They just wanted to get home. So they checked a couple boxes because it would make their, their own lives easier. After all, they don't have to drink the water. Why should they care? And the story goes on and it ends. We never find out what happens to the people who drink from this water. What happens to the towns that are going to be poisoned by it? We're left to imagine. And the brilliance of the story and why it works and why it is one of my absolute favorite horror stories is one, it has a freakish plausibility because you could see something toxic falling into our atmosphere, right? And somebody just going, I want to go home. I want to just play a game tonight or whatever. And rubber stamping and letting the reservoir go in. I see that around my home all the time. They're constantly putting in new roads and bypasses. 
and they're not doing any of the environmental studies that they need to. And with every new road that goes in, the flooding gets worse and worse and worse because they're cutting off the creeks and the culverts and the paths that the water used to drain away through. They're not here anymore. So the water has nowhere to go. And thus there's flooding because they really don't care. They just want to get their paycheck and they want to go home. So the story frighteningly has this ring of truth in it. It has a moment where you go, oh my goodness, that could actually happen. And I don't think that that's necessary for good horror. I'm a big fan of Lovecraft's work and the music of Eric Zahn is not realistic. Rats in the Walls, not realistic. Almost anything in the Cthulhu mythos. But I still enjoy those stories. I'm not saying that realism is necessarily, necessarily important in horror. What is, is this management of dread and terror and fear. Allowing us and making us feel these emotions on schedule so that they linger with us and they haunt us. This is why we have an entire Annabelle expanded universe. The first movie was, pr was pretty okay. It wasn't terrible. In fact, many of the movies that started these weird horror franchises, the first ones were okay. But if we're going to produce a lot of these, taking time to craft a story that can manage these emotions in an efficient way, well, that's troublesome, isn't it? That's problematic. So let's just take the shortcut and here's something gross to look at. Here's something disgusting happening. Here's someone jumping out at you. Boo. And those are easy shortcuts. And I'm not saying that they can't be included in, the, in a story. One of the most horrifying passages for me in um, the dream quest of For Unknown Kadath is actually when he's down in the realm, realm of the Night Gaunts and everything's that kind of black, gooey, slimy, oozy, nasty. And yeah, it's disgusting and it kind of turns my stomach. But when you see the creatures that live there, they seem like the kind of creatures you'd expect to find in a disgusting, horrible pit like that. Like with any tool at a creator's disposal, there's room for any of this to happen. There's room for any of this to be used to make for a good story. Problem is, it's also easy for a company wanting to just make a bunch of money on people who like to be scared to give a cheap roller coaster thrill of here's some gross things here's some things that jump out at you see wasn't that a good horror movie wasn't that a good horror story they're easy to turn out it's why for the most part and i haven't read them for over a decade and maybe they've gotten better but it's one of the reasons why the star trek um, novels were problematic to say the, the least because they all followed the same formula our crew arrives a couple away team members are sent down on a planet the enterprise is called away on another urgent mission all things go crazy on the planet they solve the problem and oh the enterprise is back too late to have actually helped them but that's okay because the problem has been solved Jump scares and gore, violence, these things are schedulable. They're easy, formulaic ways to engender disgust and sometimes horror in people. But they're lazy. They're cheap. They're not at least something I like to spend my time with. And so, when I can read an existential horror, I will. It's why when anybody asks me about my favorite vampire books, I almost always say the Anne Rice series, The Vampire Chronicles. Because while she could go into the you gross of the blood and just binge out on gore, especially in some of the books, most of what we're dealing with is just existential dread and terror, and fear, 
and creepiness. And it suffuses the fiction and gives it power and strength and makes it oh so good. So yeah. That, that's my personal critique of horror. And why I'm not the biggest fan. It's also why I don't use the word. I think, especially a book like Crucify My Love, for a lot of people might be seen as a horror story. I, I personally call it a gothic story. I've called it dark fantasy. But I, I don't like using the word horror because almost all the time when somebody I know recommends something horror to me, it's about being disgusted rather than being afraid. And if I'm going to invest the time in a horror... I want to be afraid. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, and you haven't already, and you can, please rate this episode so that the app that you're listening to me on knows that you liked it and can then share it with more people. That helps me out a lot. If you've got a dollar you can pass my way, please go to the show notes. You'll see a link for community support. If you click that, you can join the project at the one, five or ten dollar levels. That helps me out immensely, helps me do everything that I do. Including my fiction going forward after June, which I'm really nervous about. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who does that. If you don't already have in if if you don't have any money or you don't feel like giving right now, trust me that that's fine. I understand. I know how that is. There's a crowdfunding project I really want to give to right now and oh it's hard for me to say no to the, you know, how to, you know, say goodbye to those dollars. I understand. But if you have the inkling and you like this show and you think, you know, somebody that would like it, please share. Sharing is caring. It helps out immensely too. You can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. Come follow me on Twitter. I'm C Dorset over there. It's where I do most of my interactions. I'm also on Instagram. Same nickname. Until next time, don't forget, have the fun. Bye.